be good to go. Okay. Welcome everybody to this very cool new professional development series that we at the College Fund are um, starting today. It's going to be a four-part series on research, and we've never done this before, so we are excited to kind of try something new. And the reason we wanted to do this is that we have done a couple of surveys of faculty, one in 2020, one in 2023, we asked you what sort of support you need, what professional areas of professional development you're interested in. And based on that sur those surveys and based on like lots of conversations with faculty over the years and some of the work that we've been doing under a grant that we're receiving from the Luce, Henry Luce Foundation, which we should thank them for um, sponsoring this professional development series. Um, some of the work that we're doing with them to support faculty research at tribal colleges. We um, we wanted to offer some special professional development to faculty that would be more geared toward where you are. I mean, yes, those general research, you know, informational webinars, you know, those are helpful, but, you know, how to customize that professional development so that it's more applicable and relevant to you to, as faculty at tribal colleges. So that was kind of our intention in developing this. So we're, we're again, we're trying something new and we really appreciate your feedback as to how um, this, you know, how this went for you, areas we can improve on. Um, but anyway, so, so this is the first of a four part series. Um, really excited to have um, Susan Faircloth and Andrew Kozich um, as our co-facilitators today. Um, how this will roll out, and I just wanna welcome everybody who has joined since I started talking. If you wouldn't mind putting in the chat, introducing yourself, who you are, what you do, where you're calling from, that would be great so we can all get to know each other while we're on this 90 minute call together. Um, just wanted to give you a rundown of how our um, time together will go today. So um, Susan um, are, will be talking for about 30 minutes. I'll do introductions of each of them, but Susan will be talking and sharing with us her knowledge on research for about 30 minutes. And then I'll turn it over to Andrew Kozich, who he'll talk for about 20 minutes and share what he knows and the work that he's done um, doing research at a TCU. Then we're gonna leave lots of time for questions and discussion at the end. We don't want this just to be kind of a sit and get. We want um, to hear your questions, things that you've been thinking about. Um, so with that said, during the presentations, if you have any questions for for either of them, go ahead and put that in the chat and then we will uh, um, we will have time to have them answer those questions during their presentations. And then I just encourage you to kind of um, interact with each other on the chat during the presentations and during the discussion. Um, so this is just kind of meant to be kind of a conversation um, about research. And our first topic today is demystifying the research process. And our first um, speaker today, our first facilitator, I want to introduce um, Susan Faircloth. So Susan is a member of the Koheri tribe of North Carolina. She spent more than 20 years as a professor and an academic leader, most recently here in Colorado at Colorado State University until last year. Um, most of her work across her career has centered on indigenous education, the education of culturally and linguistically diverse students with special education needs, and the moral and ethical dimensions of school leadership. Um, so she now has a consulting business called Two Feathers Consulting, and she's going to continue to work on these um, issues and more. Um, and so as a researcher and a writer, she has published in many academic journals, so which is why we uh, asked her to um, facilitate this discussion and all four of the discussions, actually. Um, so she's published in journals like the Ed uh, Educational Administration Quarterly, the Harvard Education Review, but she's also an editor. So she sees the other side of it when these manuscripts come into these academic journals. She has served as an editor as well. Um, and she serves on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Indian Education. 
Um, she's also part of the review panel for the National Indian Education Studies. So I say all this just to kind of um, kind of showcase that she has just had a wide variety of experiences over a long period of time um, doing research um, with indigenous communities, with indigenous peoples, and for the benefit of indigenous um, communities. And last but not least, she has her PhD in educational administration with a concentration in special education from the American Indian Leadership Program at Penn State University. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give Andrew's bio right now as well, so that we can just get rolling with his presentation as well. So we're going to give a warm welcome to Andrew Kozic as well. He's chair of the Environmental Science Department at Kiwana Bay Ojibwe Community College, which, if you don't know, is located way up in northern Michigan along the shores of Lake Superior, and it's beautiful. I haven't been there, but I've seen the pictures. Um, he discovered... KBOCC in his early years when he was um, just starting his doctoral program at Michigan Tech University. Um, and then he started taking courses there and on native culture and history. And then like a year later in 2011, um, the chair position opened up for the environmental science department and he was hired. So whereas Susan is our um, higher ed and education um, expert Andrew is our water and our tree guy. So they're going to have a nice balance of the ways that they have been involved in research um, during their careers. Um, and Andrew writes grants, and I know Susan does too, but writes grants like nobody's business. He has brought in more than $2 million to his TCU for various grants. He's also reviewed grants. Um, his, you know, Andrew, more than anyone I know, among the many faculty that I know, he does an amazing job of involving his students in his community-based research. A lot of the funding that he brings in goes to pay and support these students, their involvement in collecting data analysis, uh, going to conferences. And I know some of you had asked questions uh, when you um, signed up for this series, you had questions about how to involve students in your projects. And so he's gonna be uh, especially helpful for that. And then just finally, he received our Mellon Dissertation Fellowship way back in 2015, 2016, and he did get his PhD in forest science in 2016. And then uh, interestingly, like a year later, he got an associate degree from his TCU in Anishinaabe studies. So he was one of the, he was the first student. So he's a little bit of, a, they're both kind of overachievers, aren't they? Um, so, so I just want to welcome everybody if you've logged on since I started that long um, introduction of, of both of our amazing facilitators today. Please go ahead and um, introduce yourself in the chat. We want to know who's here today. And so I am going to turn it over to Susan to begin her presentation. And again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll make sure that they get answered before we um, move on to Andrew's presentation. And then we'll have a longer discussion at the end for about 30 minutes. And we can see your presentation. Looks great, Susan. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. And Heidi, if you can just help me be a um, timekeeper, I would appreciate that. Um, as well. I, as I was listening to Heidi um, introduce us, I was thinking I need to have Heidi follow me around all the time and, and provide an introduction. It's always interesting to hear other people talk about your work. Um, and I'm also honored to be able to um, participate in this session alongside Andrew, who's really on the ground and doing the, the hard and important work in the tribal colleges. So thank you, Heidi, for this opportunity. And thank you, Andrew, for joining me this morning. So as Heidi has said, the title of today's session, and this is the first of a four-part session. So if you um, decide to participate in future sessions, you'll also have the opportunity to hear from me and Heidi again. But the focus of this session is demystifying the research process. And then I added a title after the colon, and I named that putting the pieces together. So you see puzzle pieces on the side. But before I start talking about research, I wanted to take a moment just to acknowledge the land and the place and the space from which I'm joining this conversation today. So as Heidi said earlier, I was a faculty member at Colorado State University 
um, and the director of the School of Education at Colorado State until um, last year. If anybody's thinking about career transitions, I'm happy to have conversations about, um, about those decisions and the thoughts that go into that process as well, because I think that's a critical part of faculty development as well as research and writing and teaching. But I wanted to acknowledge the land on which I'm joining the call from today. And if you see this, the picture that I have on the slide, um, it's a picture of the Horse Tooth Reservoir, which feeds um, our water system here in Northern Colorado. So I'm located in Fort Collins um, in Northern Colorado, about an hour north of Denver, almost to the Wyoming boarding border. And Fort Collins in this area of North Northern Colorado is the traditional homelands of the Cheyenne, the Ute, and the Arapaho nations and peoples. Um, we moved here about six years ago, and I'll tell this story very briefly. We moved here from North Carolina, where I was a faculty member. Um, we have a daughter who just turned 14, and we adopted her uh, when she was a day old. And so when we made this transition here to Northern Colorado, it was almost as a homecoming for us. I'm from the Kahari tribe of North Carolina. Our daughter is Cheyenne and Arapaho. Um, and was born in Oklahoma. And so being able to come back and to live and to work in the traditional homelands of our daughter's people just has incredibly special meanings and connections for us and plays into a lot of our story. But I also wanted to talk about my research journey and I'll try to do this very briefly. So I've, I've given you um, an outline that lays out how I came to become a researcher. So when I talk about my background and my identity, I start by talking about my tribal membership or citizenship. I'm a member of the Kahari tribe of North Carolina. We're located on the Eastern part of North Carolina, about an hour inland. We are a state recognized tribe. For those of you who are familiar with um, tribal politics, you know all of the, uh, the nuances and differences between state and federally recognized tribes, but that plays um, an important role in my identity and the way in which I conduct my research. But I also think about my roles and responsibilities as a mom to our daughter, Journey, as a partner to my husband, Lee, as a daughter to my parents, Jean and Marie. Um, my mother graduated from high school. My dad has an associate's degree. Um, and they attended an all-American Indian school in Eastern North Carolina, which I'll talk about because that also plays a role in my research. And then I think about my roles and responsibilities as a sister to my sister, Lori, and as an auntie to my niece, Kanani, and to my nephew, Knight. Um, and before I became a mom, I talked about and I wrote about my roles and responsibilities um, as an auntie to my niece, Kanani, and her name in Hawaiian means beautiful little one. And so a lot of my writing was about those roles and responsibilities and my relationships um, to children, but particularly in relationship to my to my niece. And then as I transitioned to become a mom, I began to talk about how those roles and responsibilities morphed. Then I also have my experiences as a scholar and now as a consultant. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was a tenured um, faculty member professor at Colorado State University and also the director of the School of Education. Before that, I worked at Penn State, North Carolina State, University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And before that, I worked as the Director of Policy Analysis and Research with the American Indian Higher Ed Consortium, which, as you most of you know, does a lot of advocacy work on behalf of the tribal colleges. And that was 20 years ago. So the opportunity to come back and engage in faculty development, again, for me, is uh, is almost a homecoming because it goes back to the roots of where I began researching. And I like to tell people that in my first week on the job as the Director of Policy Analysis and Research with AHEC, I think I unlearned everything that I knew about research and writing. Because as a doctoral student, I had the luxury and the opportunity to think deeply and to take lots of time to, to research and write. And working with the tribal colleges and particularly in the policy arena, People wanted things yesterday. Um, and so that was a whole different way of thinking about how to disseminate, how to craft and how to disseminate my research and scholarship. 
And then other examples of work I've done in the research arena, I've been an international scholar in New Zealand where I worked with deaf and hearing impaired Maori um, students and I used community-based participatory research practices with a group of high school students there. We also used photo voice, which is a visual methodology if anyone's interested in the use of images and photography, I'm happy to talk about that. I've also worked um, in Ethiopia with Addis Ababa University, mentoring um, and advising doctoral students there. And then some other examples of my research um, projects that I've been involved in. Heidi mentioned this in my introduction. I currently chair the technical review panel for the National Indian Education Study, which focuses on reading and math achievement of third and eighth grade um, students across the nation, but there's an oversample of American Indian Alaska Native students. And then we do a special study that looks at the role of language and culture in our students' educational experiences and academic achievement. I've also done work around American Indian Alaska Native students, particularly males, and the ways in which um, they persist in school. I'm trying to move away from that language of dropping out and using the language of push out because I believe strongly that there's a whole host of factors that work together to encourage um, Native students and other students of color to leave school or to be pushed out of school. I've also done work with um, large-scale databases, the early childhood longitudinal studies, where I've looked at what are those factors that place American Indian Alaska Native students at risk for special education? I've also looked at the role of Head Start and tribal Head Start programs and how that impacts our students' um, educational experiences. And then most close to my heart is a long-term research project I've been doing um, at the school that my parents attended and graduated from, the East Carolina Indian School in North Carolina, what started as a summer project about 10 years ago has now morphed into a multi-year project where I've been conducting um, oral histories using video um, to be able to capture the stories of those students who attended that all-American Indian school, as well as teachers who are still living. Um, and one story I'll share quickly is I had the opportunity to interview a teacher um, who was in her 90s who had Alzheimer's. And on the day that I interviewed her, she was able to remember being a teacher in that school. And so when you think about the power of research, you know, having that story, having this visual image of her talking about her experience at that school, you know, it, it's not only informative for me as a researcher, but I think it's an excellent example of how we can work to preserve and conserve um, and to share our histories in ways that are authentic to us, our histories and our cultures. And then why do I do this work? I do this work because of the people who are um, who are shown in this photo. So on one side of the slide, and I'm a bit directionally challenged, so I don't wanna say left or right, but on one side of the slide, you see a um, group of native people who were in the first cohorts of native students to go to Penn State through the American Indian Leadership Program. Some of them have worked in tribal colleges. In the middle is Dr. Jerry Gipp, who used to be the executive director of AHEC, Linda Warner, who was a former president of Haskell. And then you see other people who have been really instrumental in um, not only the, only the education of American Indian and Alaska Native students, but also in health, education, and welfare. On the other side, you see my family, my parents, my husband, my daughter, our niece. And in the middle, you see the newest member of our family, my nephew, Knight. And so when I think about the work that I do as a researcher, I do it in honor and in remembrance of my family and the contributions that they've made and those individuals who've allowed me to be able to pursue my doctoral degree and to be able to do research. But I also do it um, in remembrance and in honor of this group of students that you see pictured here. And this is a group of students who attended the um, Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And if you know the history of Indian education and its roots in boarding schools and the motto or mantra of Carlisle Indian Industrial School was kill the Indian to save the man. And we still are experiencing the effects of that um, educational policy and set of practices on generations today, generations of native people who are mistrusting or distrusting of educational systems and organizations. And so in my work, I try to think about ways that we can rewrite 
um, and, and honor educational systems so that our students, our children can attend school and be in environments where they don't have to make choices between their language and culture and their academic um, success or excellence. So then I'll transition into, into thinking about research and writing. If there's one book that I would suggest that all of you buy, it's a book called Bird by Bird, and it's by a writer named Anne Lamott. It's a really thin, quick read. And it's one of the first books that was suggested to me when I became a faculty member, when I was really struggling with how do I, how do I balance my teaching and my research and my service and having a life outside of the institution. And someone suggested I read this book. And there's a quote in it when the author, Anne Lamont, is asked, you know, how do you do a particular project? And she tells a story in that book about her brother when he was in elementary or middle school and he had a project that was due the next day. And it was about um, writing about birds. And so there were about 50 different birds that he had to write about. And he sat at the kitchen table and he asked his dad, how do I get this done? It's done, it's due tomorrow. I haven't started on it. And his dad said, you just do it bird by bird, buddy. Just take it bird by bird. And so when I think about the writing process or I think about research, my best advice to each of you is to take it bird by bird, to really break it down, to think about the different components of your research and not to become overwhelmed by it. Heidi and Andrew and I had a, a conversation about this, how research can really be overwhelming and scary. And a lot of people think about research being this huge, massive undertaking, but it can be something as simple as being in your classroom at a tribal college and thinking about an issue, for example, you know, why are my students um, coming to class late? Well, how do we provide childcare for our students who have children or who are raising family members? And you can use research to be able to think about an issue or a topic like that and to come up with solutions and resolutions. So again, bird by bird, step by step. It's also important to understand what research is and what research isn't. So research is thought about as being an organized, systematic inquiry aimed at answering a question or a set of questions. And so the question that you want to answer or the set of questions that you want to answer is critically important. It also requires a research um, goal, a set of objectives, and a research plan. We also talked, Heidi and I talked a little bit about the difference between research and evaluation. And I know in tribal colleges, there is a lot of grant funding or temporary one-time funding, and not only in the colleges, but also with AHEC and with the college fund. And so there's a lot of evaluation going on in these um, organizations. What is interesting for me is that when I look at the difference between research and evaluation, and I've given you a link that I would encourage you um, all, and I'll, Heidi will have a copy of this PowerPoint so you can access the links. But when, when I try to understand what the difference is between research and evaluation, there really appears to be a lack of consensus or agreement about where research begins and ends and where evaluation begins and ends. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. But there is a definition from the American Evaluation Association that um, describes evaluation as a systematic process used to determine the merit the worth, the value, or the significance of something. And in particular, like the merit, the value, the worth, or the significance of a project or a series of projects that are funded. In research, you're not necessarily trying to determine the merit, the worth, or the value of, of something. You are looking at the significance. Why is this important? What's the potential impact? So, so there's some overlap, but there's also some distinctions. Um, I think one of the keys to being able to distinguish between research and evaluation is that evaluation tends to focus on assessing effectiveness, impact, outcomes of a specific program or project. Evaluation also tends to be led or directed by external forces. So there's someone telling you what it is that you need to be looking at as opposed to research where you're coming up with your research questions and your research goals and objectives and you're having to articulate why that question or set of questions is important. What I always tell my students is before you begin researching anything is that you need to read and you need to read deeply. What do I mean by reading deeply? I mean, 
if you have a lot to do and so sometimes you're skimming but I think that you have to understand what the literature is that's currently existing on your topic. And for those of us who are working in American Indian, uh, particularly American Indian education, there's not a wealth of research out there. So when I'm reading, I'm looking for what's in the research, but I'm also looking for what's missing. So I would encourage each of you to do that well. There's also value in coupling that review of the existing research and literature with your own scan, right, of the environment and understanding the context in which you're going to work, understanding the variables, understanding what the issues are, the challenges, as well as the opportunities. So read and think deeply before you begin researching. There are also a number of questions that I would recommend that you consider when you're designing a research um, study. Number one, to think about what it is that you're interested in researching and why, and what is your research question I, or set of questions. I think back to my dissertation research more than 20 years ago. And when I told my department chair what I was interested in studying, and I looked at what do school principals who work in predominantly American Indian, Alaska Native schools, what do they know or need to know about special ed? When I told my department chair what my topic was, he, he said, Susan, that's not a very sexy um, research question. And I thought, sexy research? Like, how can research be sexy? And 20 years later, I can't think of anything that's more sexy or exciting for me than trying to understand the ways in which our children, particularly children with special needs, live and learn and work in schools and how their administrators or school leaders understand them and their needs and are able to support their teachers and to support their students and their families. So I would encourage each of you to think about what it is that you're interested in. What are you passionate about, right? What is it that brings you joy and excitement? And it can be something very small or it can be something large. Also understanding, is there a need for your research and what is the significance of it? I always tell people, if you can answer your research question with a yes or a no, then perhaps it's not a research question, right? So if it's something that you can say, yes, there's a need for this, okay, that, that that's interesting, but it may not necessarily be a research question. So is it significant? And what do you hope to achieve in conducting your research? Where will you conduct the research? Who will participate in your study? What research design or designs will you use? And what do you need in order to successfully conduct your research? Andrew and, and um, Heidi and I talked about this yesterday, you know, particularly when you have these, these multiple roles of teaching and service um, and other kinds of things, administrative work, grant work. You know, In order to be able to successfully engage in research, you may need additional time or release time, funding, personnel, equipment, um, just so really being clear about what it is that you need in order to do the research. And then there are a number of ethical considerations in your research, particularly when you're working with American Indian individuals, communities, tribes, organizations. I really think about the importance of relationships. What do those relationships look like? How do we establish them? How do we maintain those relationships? I think about my responsibilities. Am I responsible to an institution, to an organization, to a community, to an individual, to a tribe? What do those responsibilities look like? I think about respect, respect for those individuals and communities in the research process. I think about transparency. Can we be really honest and upfront about what it is that we propose to do and the potential impacts of that work on those individuals and communities? And for me, reciprocity really stands out as a major ethical um, responsibility. So in terms of, of the ethic of re reciprocity, I believe that it requires us to ask ourselves a set of questions, including what am I prepared to give back to those individuals and communities that I'm working with and that I'm working for? How, what do I as a researcher gain from engaging in this, in this work? And how do I and how do we clearly articulate and demonstrate the reciprocal aspects of this work? For example, how are we going to translate our research or our scholarship into practice? What impact is it going to have? And so when you think about that reciprocity, it's not a one-way 
relationship. It's it's a, um, a two-way relationship where you're thinking about your responsibilities to those individuals and communities and what they're gaining from this work, but you're also thinking about what it is that you're gaining from this from this work. Other ethical principles, it's important to make sure that your research um, participants are subjects. Sometimes we think about them as partners, that they have informed consent so that they understand what it is that you're doing, how you're doing it, the potential benefits, the potential risk, and that they understand that they have the right to withdraw from your research or from your study. You also, I also believe in this principle of doing no harm, um, and it, that is an ethical principle that's laid out particularly in research that's funded um, by the federal government or by federal agencies. But I think it's critical to our work is making sure that we're doing work that's in the best interest of those individuals or organizations, or in the case of you're working with animals, right, or non-human beings, thinking about how you can um, not do harm or cause harm to those individuals and communities. It's important to protect vulnerable populations. For example, you might be working with individuals in prisons or incarcerated. You might be working with children in the foster care welfare system. You might be working with elderly individuals, individuals who are pregnant, individuals who uh, are engaged in alcohol and drug abuse. All of those are vulnerable populations. So being careful to protect their interest. There's um, the requirement to protect privacy of your participants, not to deceive them in your work, and not tampering or harming the natural environment that you're working in. And then I've given you a list. I will not read all these, these resources. I've given you a list of um, resources that you can click on and peruse at your own leisure. But these are specific um, examples of guidance that's provided if you're planning to conduct research with American Indian communities. So there are different types of research methods or design. I've given you three, qualitative, which is about storying, um, quantitative, which is more about measurement, mixed methods, which tends to combine. You might have um, qualitative methods and quantitative methods combined into one research study. You can also have mixed methods that are using multiple qualitative approaches or multiple quantitative approaches. What I believe is that it's critically important to not let your research design or method guide your work, but to let your research question or topic guide your design. So I'll say that again. A lot of people will say, I'm a qualitative researcher, I wanna tell stories. I'm a quantitative researcher, I wanna crunch numbers. I'm going to do a study that's qualitative or quantitative. And then I ask them, what's your research question? I don't know, but I know I'm a qualitative researcher or I'm quantitative. So I really encourage you to think about what your research questions are, what it is that you want to understand, and then design a study based on those um, goals or objectives. Some examples of qualitative research, there's narrative where you're telling stories, you might use autobiographies, life histories, interviews, journaling, reviewing letters, case studies. That's where you're looking at a phenomenon and you're trying to understand it by um, developing either a single case study or multiple case studies. And you are typically spending a lot of time like embedded in a particular environment trying to understand that particular case. There's action research, and I see action research as having a lot of potential in the tribal colleges. I gave an example of the beginning. There might be an issue or a problem of practice in your classroom or at your university. You're trying to understand it, action research, and then come up with a solution or a resolution. Um, and action research is a really good way of doing that. There's also ethnography, which is aimed at understanding behaviors, understanding cultures of a group, their norms, their ways of interacting. And uh, it focuses on shared beliefs, practices, artifacts, cultural knowledge. It typically involves participant observation, interviews, and collection and review of artifacts. And then there's phenomenology, which for me is one of the most complicated forms of qualitative research. It's about making meaning out of something and trying to understand how a particular um, experience, what it looks like and how that um, experience is playing out. It typically involves in-depth interviews, but it's also much more in-depth than that. And then there's quantitative research. Some examples include survey research. You can also have basic descriptive statistics, 
there's correlational studies, and there's experimental designs. Regardless of what type of research design you use, and I use that metaphor of research designs as being a map, right? A guidebook, helping you understand where you're going. It's also important to think about the theories that guide your research. And for me, I often find people trying, they, they've seen a theory that they've heard about in grad school or they've heard about it from one of their colleagues and they say, I'm gonna use that theory. For example, critical theory or, or tribal critical theory. Um, they're going to use that theory, but they don't understand how they're going to use that theory. And so I talk to my students about understanding, in some cases, there's not an existing theory that you can apply to your work, but you have a cultural understanding of the communities that you work in and that you live in. And perhaps you're going to generate some theories that help to explain this phenomenon or this issue that you're trying um, to understand. But theory for me is important in helping you to understand relevant concepts, key variables, helping to shape the questions that you're gonna research, helping to shape your research design, helping you to decide how you're gonna collect data and how you're going to interpret your findings. As a part of your data collection and analysis, you'll need to be thinking about, are you going to use surveys, interviews, questionnaires, observations? Are you going into the archives? Are you analyzing secondary data? How will you store your data? How will you ensure confidentiality and anonymity of your participants? And then you also need to think about what methods or approaches that you'll use to analy analyze your data. How will you code your data? Um, and so there's this is a whole nother conversation and I know I'm going through this quickly, but if anybody wants additional information on any of these topics that I've shared, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to, um, to guide you to some additional um, resources. And then it's also important to think about after you've collected these data, what are you going to do with them? How are you going to disseminate your research? How are you going to utilize it? And so I've given you some examples. And these are examples of potential publications or places to publish your research. There's also examples of places that you can go and present. Um, someone mentioned that they were in Orlando last week with Achieving the Dream. That's not one of the resources that I listed here. I had the opportunity to attend that conference for the first time myself. And I would say that's a great place to think about presenting. There, there were tribal colleges there that were presenting on how they've used data to improve their student enrollment management practices or how they've used data to be able to um, support their students and increase their graduation rates, uh, increase retention and persistence. And so it's not just about publishing your research or scholarship in a journal. It's about thinking about how you get this information out to your community, how you get it out to your colleagues, how you get it out to the larger field. And then I think it's, I'm almost at the end, Heidi, it's, it's important to be self-reflective about the work that you're doing. And so in my own work, I'm constantly asking myself, am I doing this work in a good way? Am I doing this research and scholarship in ways that mirror those ethics or reflect those ethics that I talked about earlier? Am I doing this work in relationship? Am I doing this work um, with an ethic of reciprocity? Am I doing it in a respectful way? Am I doing it in ways that are relevant? Am I doing harm? And so I, I like to, to draw on this quote from researchers Peacock and Cleary, and they're talking specifically about American Indian education. And they write, you know, there is so much to be done. There's disappearing native languages and oral histories and stories that we need to protect. There are rights that need to be protected. And there's a hopeful and purposeful futures for our communities, for our colleges, for our children. Um, and so we have this responsibility as both Native and non-Native researchers, teachers, community members, to be able to harness this knowledge and to use the collective wisdom that we have from working and living in these communities to be able to support and promote those hopeful futures. If we really want our research, our research work, and I put work in quotes, right, because work is different for everybody. But if we really want this research or our scholarship to have a positive impact, then I believe that we have to, to think critically about the ways in which we approach and engage in this work. So in my own research work, I find it helpful to ask a number of questions. Um, for example, 
what I think about stories a lot. And so I ask myself, what are these stories that are being told in the communities or with the groups and organizations that I'm working with? What are the stories that are being told in relation to indigenous peoples and communities? Are these stories accurate? How do we ensure that the narratives or the stories that are being shared are accurate? Who's, uh, what stories are being erased or omitted? What stories need to be told? Who gets to tell these stories? Who gets to determine who tells these stories? Because I believe strongly that there's a lot of cultural knowledge in our communities that is not to be shared outside of those communities. And so we have to think, or that outsiders don't have the right to come in and access that knowledge and tell it. And so we have to think about who gets to tell these stories? How do we tell them? How do we tell them authentically? How do we tell these stories and hold these stories with care and concern um, for those individuals and communities who have gifted us with their stories? And then it's important to think about what stories will we tell? How will we use these stories to in, enact positive chain in action, change in action? And so even for those who are not in education, you know, Andrew's talking about science um, and, you know, natural sciences. And so there are stories there to be told, right? Migration stories. There's stories about the environment. Um, stories can be told in a variety of different um, places and ways. And then I end with this, this slide. And this is from a scholar out of New Zealand. And she writes, as scholars, we have an ethical imperative to bring our research insights to bear on the educational experiences and well-being of children and families. I think you can take education out of this quote and you can insert any of the various fields that you're working in. And you can think about the ethical imperatives that you have to bring this work to bear on those communities and individuals that you're working with. Um, and so I'll stop there, but just to say, I love research. I love scholarship. I hope that comes across um, in my presentation. I believe that it, the simplest of questions are important and can have important impacts on our communities. Um, I also believe that it's important to do this work in partnership and in community. And for example, the work that I did in New Zealand, I was partnering with high school students, giving them cameras and supporting them and being able to talk about their identities as Maori indigenous peoples and their identities as um, deaf individuals, right? So I gave them the tools to be able to tell their stories, but they told their stories. And so that is a great example for me of how we can do this work in partnership. We can do it um, in community. And we can do work that has the potential to be able to impact not only the academic community, but it can impact policy and practice. So I will stop there and I know we have time for questions later. Thanks, Heidi. Great, thank you. Perfect. I'm gonna change it to, there we go, there's the gallery. Yeah, so we will have time for a longer discussion at the end of Andrew's conversation, but did anyone have any um, questions that want to clarify anything that um, Susan just said? Happy to, to take a few minutes right now before we move on. So go ahead and unmute yourself, and I don't think I see anything in the chat. Heidi, I'll just say as, as people are thinking or as you're preparing to transition to Andrew, I want to acknowledge that and we talked about this yesterday. This was a very surface level, like quick, fast, and dirty approach to research. Any of these topics we could spend a whole hour and a half or a day or a semester on. And so I don't want anybody to think that it's like we've covered everything here. But but what I hope comes out of this is that it um, it sparks an excitement or an interest in doing research and recognizing that research is doable, right? Um, and I'll end by saying this, I come from a family where I'm a first generation college student. You know, my mom graduated from high school and worked in a hog slaughtering factory for 40 years. My dad has an associate's degree and was a police officer. They had not done research. They don't talk the language of research. What I did do in my first job as a professor was I needed my family to understand this language that I speak as a researcher. And so I took my mother with a high school degree to the American Educational Research Association. I needed her to be able to go there and hear me present and see the purple that people that I worked with and understand that language. 
because I felt like I was navigating these two worlds, neither of which I felt comfortable in. And so bringing my mom along with me and having her understand or being engaged in that conversation was critically important. And then when I talk about the oral histories that I did at the school my parents attended, my mom was my co-researcher. So my mom was along with me when I conducted interviews. She asked questions. She helped recruit participants. She helped explain the context, right? And so for me, being able to have her alongside with me was, was really important. But the two people that I've not been able to interview about this school are my mother and my father. Mm. And I've not been able to do that because as I talked with those individuals in the community, they told me things about my parents that I didn't know and their experiences. And I don't know that I'm ready to hold their stories. Mm. My dad now is in the early stages of dementia, and I'm afraid that I've missed that window to be able to capture his story. And so for me, when I think about the importance of storying, it is about maintaining for me, our languages and our cultures and our histories and this cultural wealth of knowledge that we have. And so I would just say to each of you, regardless of where you come from or your experience with research, don't, don't be afraid to dip your toes into the water because if you don't, you may miss this opportunity or this window to capture and to share these, these important stories and knowledge about the communities that you're working in. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's a great reminder. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation and sharing knowledge and um, experiences with us. And I um, would like to move on next to Andrew Kozich. So I've already introduced him and excited to hear what he has to say about research. And he's gonna start off with just a little bit about why he got into research and how he manages it all as a, a TCU faculty member. So it's up to you. Take it away, Andrew. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Susan, for that awesome way to get us started. Well, there's so much you touched on that, uh, that I hope to build on at least a little bit as part of my story. But uh, as you said, any of those topics you brought up could be their own uh, focus for an entire session, that's for sure. But um, uh, building on the introduction that, that Heidi provided and uh, some of the um, some of Sarah's insights or uh, Susan's insights, I'll say that uh, one of my favorite sayings to my students involving research um, to get some laughs and to be humble is that if I can do it, any old dummy can, right? So uh, there's uh, thinking about the idea of being uh, af afraid or intimidated of research or thinking of it as a big formal thing. The one thing I hope to impart um, on you all today is that uh, research can be integrated into things you're already doing and you, you may already be doing research without knowing it. Um, also, um, it's exciting to think that uh, you never know where research can take a person. Heidi mentioned that I study things like uh, water and trees and stuff. And while that's generally uh, or certainly true, I've also found myself um, just based on the nature of work that I've done, um, having to immerse myself in things like uh, the theory of planned behavior, which comes from the field of psychology or um, toxicology is another good example, um, just because it relates to uh, things I've done involving environmental health. So a lot to be excited about. So let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Okay. So um, basically my goal is to just share a little bit about um, what I've learned along the way. Um, things that may or may not apply uh, to other institutions, other um, other disciplines. But uh, let's see, okay. I've got to move some things on my screen here. Okay. Hopefully you can all recognize this uh, simple map image as being the Great Lakes area. And as Heidi mentioned, um, I'm come from the northern part. So pretty much right in the center of that uh, red square that you see. And here's some pictures of what uh, what my world looks like. So yeah, Heidi nailed it again. 
There's lots of water and lots of trees. So I, I fit in pretty well here. Um, here's a little image of um, the front of my college, KBOCC. And again, um, I just hope to touch on some things that I've picked up along the way involving some of these big picture questions. Um, what is research, how a person can get started, and uh, what um, some of the positive impacts can be. And this is one of my favorite pictures that's on the screen right now because this is a good example of a positive impact. So there I am with a few of my students at a uh, conference that we were able to attend because of uh, having funds available through a research grant. And lo and behold, at this conference, we got the chance to meet uh, Dr. Kyle White, uh, who's in the center of the, of the picture, who is uh, an amazing Anishinaabe uh, scholar from Michigan. And uh, there he was uh, as the keynote speaker in, the, in this very semester, the students in this picture and I uh, had spent a lot of time um, reading his works and watching some of his lectures on YouTube. And lo and behold, there he was at this conference. So right off the bat there, there's something that's a little example of, of a really cool, um, broader impact of getting involved in research. So what is research? That seems to be a common question. Well, I was thinking, well, what would my students do? Let's look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, that's probably not setting good examples, but. Uh, research is a creative and systematic work undertaken to increase the stock of knowledge. Okay. Um, now, you know, you're a nerd when you start pitching books in uh, Zoom conferences. So mine is uh, research is share a ceremony, an amazing book that I think should be on everybody's desk um, by Sean Wilson. Again, a topic that could be uh, its own uh, 30 minute presentation. But in my words, again, research can be anything, um, I think, and you're probably already doing it. And I'll, um, I've got a lot of photos to illustrate examples of how I incorporate research throughout um, everything I do. So a big question is why? Why get involved with research? And here's kind of a short list of, of why I do it. Um, again, for me, the biggest priority is benefits to the students in terms of experiences, um, lots of different examples of support. Um, in my own journey as a student, somehow I made it all the way to the bachelor's degree level and beyond without even knowing what research is. I found myself as a first year master's student having to ask my advisor, what is research? Because my learning experience to that point was driving to campus, you know, as a commuter student who worked, and sitting in classrooms and reading books, doing homework, passing exams, and that was it. Luckily, I'm enough of a nerd that that, that kept me engaged, but um, I don't think that's a, a very rich experience nowadays. So incorporating research into curriculum uh, can just make for such a richer experience for students. Also, I think it's important to be able to, to enhance re institutional capacity, especially at tribal colleges. And I, I like to use the word um, getting us on the map, right? Or, or bringing us to the table, use whatever, um, you know, whatever cliche you'd like, they're, they're, they all matter. Uh, but it is important to prove that, you know, small colleges, especially tribal colleges, that, you know, we can do this as well. So I think that's an important reason to get involved with research. Specifically for things that I do, um, it's all about the community as well, which of course includes uh, everything that, um, you know, direct benefits to the students and their experiences. But um, being involved in environmental science, most of my projects begin as uh, some sort of uh, maybe issue of concern, current issue in the community, something that's identified that uh, natural resource personnel wish they understood better. And so that's where I've been able to come in. And so a lot of the work, um, like Heidi mentioned, I, I do a lot of work involving um, water. Um, a lot of what I do is tied into our local fisheries, our streams and lakes, 
And so the work I do and the data I collect actually provides guidance to the boots on the ground um, personnel at our tribe's natural resource department. I mentioned toxicology. Um, I just kind of heard through the grapevine over the last few years, a lot of people in the, in the community having concerns about what's in our groundwater, um, possible heavy metals like uh, uranium, arsenic, um, limited resources for any kind of research or, or testing. Um, lots of people in homes with wells um, that uh, maybe they don't know what's in their water or how safe it is because, again, um, like most tribal colleges, we're located in a very rural, pretty isolated area. Um, so I began a study of, um, of groundwater that didn't just seek to answer questions like, well, what is in the water? What are the relationships between geology, possible contamination, right? That's kind of the, the natural science stuff. But um, the other part is kind of what I would call the, um, the Aaron Brockovich part, which is to actually go out and test people's water and not only identify any possible problems or risks, but to provide solutions. So in, in the funding I acquired to do that, um, I was able to actually purchase a pretty big room full of uh, reverse osmosis systems that I provided for free, including installation for people's uh, people whose water I found to have problems. So another example of a of a community um, benefit. And we've all kind of touched on this. It is important, you know. We all have gifts. Any of us who are in the positions that we're in and um in, or or in the process of um you know a graduate school education we all have gifts and talents to provide so um a good reason to do research is just to be what i call just being a good scientist com uh, in contributing to the the wide body of knowledge so I'm glad that we already knocked out um, the first bullet point on this list as far as how to get started. To me, all the best words start with the letter R. And just as a, a refresher, we're talking relationship, respect, reciprocity, responsibility. I think that needs to be at the forefront of, um, of anybody's motivations for why to get involved in research. And also... Again, this is where my story and my reality may be a little different than any of yours, um, but I'm pretty sure we're all uh, faced with some of the same struggles, which is having a lot on our plate and there's only so many hours in a week. So I think it's important from a tribal college or from a tribal college perspective to acknowledge that reality. Um, and along with that, being humble and being aware of, you know, our abilities to take on additional work on top of our 40 hour a week faculty job or whatever, you know, it may be for me as a department chair. Um, I mentioned this um, to Heidi and Susan yesterday, and this is the exact truth. My job description has 26 bullet points and research is not on that. So for me and my perspective, um, Research is actually overload. It's supported. It's in, in. It's encouraged, but it's not required. So it's 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 overload, and it's something to take pretty seriously. So, um, as a, an initial little bit of advice, I would caution everyone to to know your limits, and maybe to be at your current position long enough that that you're comfortable with it and you you have your systems down and your efficiency and you know what you can accomplish and if you even have the ability to take on additional work another important uh point though is to also know your institution's policies and resources because they can, they're probably different at every institution and i'll bring up an example of of mine next um knowing whose approval you need whether in the institution or beyond um Susan mentioned uh, IRBs. Um, in some cases, maybe there could be a tribal, um, you know, political leadership approval that you need, tribal council, signature of the of the tribal president. Those are things to be aware of and how long those can take. 
as well as possible grant funding sources out there. So I think a part of research that that you want to keep in mind is, well, what about researching opportunities to get money? Because whether we like it or not, money makes things possible. So all of these things, these positive outcomes that, I, that I'll be touching on here, it, it's all because of finding money to make things happen. So if you put all this together, one of my big takeaways is this last bullet point. Um, maybe think about just starting small. That's what I did uh, to find out what I could manage um, given all my other responsibilities. So for example, on my first um, research grant, I think was $5,000 for just a small one-year project. Um, and that that worked well. So then I looked for maybe something in the ten dollars or $25,000 range, and then maybe $50,000. And there's, there's good reasons to go for small money. For one, it it's, tends to be less competitive. Um, but also it can help us all kind of know where our guardrails need, need to be with what we're able to take on because obviously bigger money means bigger projects, which means more responsibilities, which means a lot to manage. And it can take time to get comfortable with that. Um, I know this is probably really small on your screen, but this is an example of what I had to dig up when I started inquiring about research. Because when I joined KBOCC in 2011, nobody was doing research on the faculty end. So we actually were kind of in the early developmental stage of some policies, but this comes right from our faculty handbook. And it tells me everything I need to know about what I'm allowed to do, um, what the overload limits are in terms of hours. Um, so I'm sure, well, I hope, would hope every institution has some sort of um, policy language in place, and that's something you'll want to be familiar with. We already mentioned the R words, the importance of, uh, of those in terms of uh, determining research topics and relevance. So Heidi shared some insight as far as, you know, um, curiosities or questions from any of you who are on this, on this call about, um, you know, questions you had as far as how to get going and how to pick topics. Um, so the little words of wisdom I have here are to start with what you know, first of all. But if you're going to be uh, having any intentions, like I hope you would, of involving students, then maybe the question would be, well, what are they interested in as well? Because that would lend itself to linking research and your classroom curriculum, which I think is extremely valuable. I already mentioned the, uh, the idea of community concerns. Are there topics out there in your community that, um, you know, that, that, that they would like addressed? And again, if you have the skills and the ability and the, and the gifts, that's a good example of serving your community. So kind of having a pulse on, on you know, what the, what the community is talking about or asking about is important. And um, of course, uh, even though some of us, like me, may come from a, a mainstream a university a science background, uh, cultural integration is important too in terms of the relevance and I would say especially from the end of the students right um, so if you put all this together um, we all have something that we've learned that we specialize in that we know a thing or two about and that's important that matters you know you are the expert on this topic but when it comes to research it's it's not all about that there's a lot of other things to consider so um, remember your humility is what I would say but here's some examples of um, when I say research can be anything. Funny again that Heidi mentioned water and trees. Here's pictures of my students doing things with water and trees. But here we are doing some basic environmental research as part of my classrooms because when it's uh, the nice time of year, meaning nice enough weather to be outdoors, this is what my students want to do. They want to go and learn outdoors and do hands on work. So um, I found ways to incorporate research into curriculum and to have those links very clear to the students. So here they are collecting data, going through the research process, but I, I use this as a foundation um, to tell them that, you know, these same types of skills that they build or that they develop or that they would end up building on in their capstone research projects and they could end up building on as research assistants to me in formal grant funded research. This past fall, I taught uh, my 
course that I teach in um, forest ecology, we had the opportunity to get involved in the construction of a lodge on our campus, a traditional teaching lodge. And I was able to uh, link this to my classroom curriculum um, by in involving our studies of trees and habitats and, you know, knowing what, uh, which trees are maybe the best ones to choose for harvesting. Um, and this, this partnered really well with the guidance of our, um, of our cultural advisor we have on campus, who's a third degree Medewin. So uh, the integration of traditional knowledge alongside, you know, a little bit of, I guess what we could call modern um, science knowledge was really cool. And I'll even take this a step further. Here's some of my students after uh, spending an afternoon picking up garbage along the highway. And uh, an example of uh, something I do in my department, uh, you know, serving the community a little bit. And you might notice that the highways in our areas are in very scenic areas. Uh, there's trees, there's water again in the background. So even this can be a learning opportunity as we're walking along highways along these beautiful settings to, to pause and you know maybe form relationships with with the uh with our surroundings by studying trees studying water so um these things can be fun and it's an example of involving involving research in just about anything it doesn't have to be this big formal thing it can be but it doesn't have to be so last few slides here in terms of positive impacts um this is basically why i do what i do and uh, as Heidi knows, why I, I put myself through sleep deprivation to take on all this extra work. Um, the student engagement is, again, the biggest thing. And um, I can back this up right now as I'm going through a five-year program review process um, by hard data on retention numbers and completion numbers from my students compared to, to other programs and how they continue to increase. And I, I really believe that that this is why. It's all of this added engagement. It's getting involved, um, having some ownership in this process, being able to contribute and, and maybe even to ask, ask their own questions and develop their own uh, sub-themes in terms of study areas. Um, I briefly mentioned capstone projects. So our, our students, even at the associate degree level, do have to do independent capstone projects as part of their graduation. They also have to complete internships. So the model that I've been using the last few years is to have, have students develop capstone projects that, that fit within the umbrella of one of the broader projects that I'm doing that allows me to hire them and pay them a wage as assistants and yet to develop their own little unique sub-theme. And um, I mentioned getting them out to conferences, networking, meeting other people. Um, all of these things are connected, so it's hard to tell where, where one thing ends and the other starts. At this point, I, I honestly believe that research is incorporated somehow into everything I do. Um, and I think these are very important experiences for students. They, they tell me that they're important experiences, and I have no reason to um, not believe them. In fact, we're ramping up now for the upcoming uh, uh, AHEC Student Annual Conference. I think we have 18 of our students going. Um, about half of those are, are my advisees, and they're all going to be participating in the events and presenting research posters and oral presentations. So it's going to be another one of my big proud advisor moments. And basically to end up here, I've just got a few more pictures that I love. My students doing things out in the field, smiling faces, um, I love this this slide because the the picture in the in the middle that's uh, one of my students named Sarah who's an elder and I always like to to tell the story that uh, as part of the research team all we had asked her to do was to be the boss and we all know that that's what elders are good at right so we basically told her to supervise the younger students out um, as, as part of the field work. Um, students also learn important um, important computational liter literacy skills, uh, learning software. So here's a picture of uploading data, um, getting to know Excel and other programs. That's one of my students learning alongside from one of our uh, natural resource department partners who is um, 
actually works as a contractor for a lot of my uh, a lot of my research projects. But again, the hands-on work, a lot of these uh, projects, well, actually all three of these pictures, these were uh, taken as part of uh, the student-led capstone project. So again, linked to my broader project, but it was in each case their own their own little thing. Um, pictures from students giving presentations at conferences. Again, one of my favorite things to help. And this is an example, well, there's a kind of a last major point of how this is all connected. So going beyond the actual, you know, collecting data, publishing things, beyond all that, um, this is an example of, of some of the peripheral benefits from, um, from one of my grants. This is one that just got funded re recently. Um, providing resources um, for all these things on this screen. Um, at a new adjunct instructor, as most of us at tribal colleges, you know, probably have pretty tight institutional budgets. We wish we could hire more people, but you know, we're told that we can't. But if uh, if you're able to write a little bit of salary money into a grant, um, this is something can be done. Also, providing some funding for again, I mentioned our um, Anishinaabe cultural advisor. Basically, I'm able to provide some basically some side income to have him allocate extra time to come in and get involved in my environmental science courses. So, you know, again, it's not just traditional science, the culture is integrated as well. And also bringing in our math faculty as part of the research grant and to provide tutoring, uh, you know, funding for dedicated time for tutoring, mentoring my capstone students, so that helps them you know, with their graduation research projects. And this is a model I like to use um, that basically ties all this together about the student research experience and all these little bubbles on the side are are the things that, that come out of that. And again, this is possible in my case by acquiring funding to make things happen. So I know it sounds really cliche, but it is true. Money makes things possible because, you know, nobody should work for free, right? Um, not any of us and definitely not um, our students when we're asking them to, to um, put in extra time and effort beyond the classroom. So some legitimate questions as my final thoughts are, you know, these are things that have worked for me. Can it be replicated in your institution, in your program, in your discipline area? Um, I don't know, uh, but that's something for, for you to consider. Um, and again, knowing your policies could be, uh, could be an important place to start. Um, there's always some risks that for any of us that maybe institutional policy changes from above could have an impact. And just as, a, as an example, um, I've had some pushback from other faculty members that have that actually did not like this idea of me taking on all this extra work. Um, and I, I hate to point it out, but I mean, it's true. Um, some of the thoughts were it makes them look bad for not doing that, in, maybe in the eyes of the students. So that's an important consideration. And lastly, these things that I do as overload, is it manageable? Is it sustainable? I mean, those are legitimate questions. Um, the manageable question would be, you know, that would be different for, for any of us. How, how many tasks can we effectively oversee at once? That's an important question. And is it sustainable? For example, what happens if the grant money dries up? Um, that's, that's a legitimate question. Would all of these things come crashing down? So um, those are things I haven't had to worry about, at least not yet, but those are important things for everyone to consider. So uh, this is where I will end this. I have many people to thank and acknowledge. Um, and I think I'll just kind of narrow it down here and say most importantly, um, the bottom bullet point, Heidi, and the never ending support from the American Indian College Fund. I, I never would have thought as a, uh, as a non-Native graduate student that I would have gotten everything I've gotten from the College Fund over the years. Um, Heidi mentioned a fellowship and all of the different things I'm able to do with the College Fund. Just an amazing resource, an amazing group of people, and I uh, continue to be thankful to this day. So I think, I'm sorry, Heidi, I haven't been watching the time, but I'm, I'm sure I'm probably <laughs> out of time. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. There's always 
so much more to say. Um, and so many questions and so many thoughts are going through my mind. And my guess is that some of you have questions, you have some ahas. Um, so we want to open it up right now to any questions or any anything that you've, you're inspired by. Please feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. And we've got about 13 minutes left. So um, we'll try to make each of your comments or questions as brief as possible. So feel free to unmute yourself. Anyone have any questions or thoughts? Um, I just have a quick thought to share. I really appreciate the sort of overview that was provided. Some of the things that we need to consider as we're moving forward with research. Um, it's a pretty daunting task. And I, you know, and it's been a while since I engaged with a research project. So this has been really helpful. It gives me a lot to think about. So I'm developing a lot of questions as I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. So Vicki is at the College of Menominee Nation. So thank you. Yeah. What else are you all thinking? Does this seem doable for you? How many of you are engaged in research right now or are getting ready to um, jump in with a project? Roxanne. Hi, um, I just wanted to say I, I love the uh, presentation and um, I was fortunate enough to do a USDA grant and it, one of those NEFA grants. And I just wanna encourage other faculty to maybe look at um, your, your other four-year colleges as a collaborator also, because that was very helpful. That way I, was, I wasn't the only one, I was a co-PI. And we, we did some wonderful things with the Buffalo here at Fort Peck. And, and it just kind of just started, you know, you talk about sustainability. It's really uh, allowed us to look at other opportunities for grant ideas. And we've received other research um, projects. And I, it's, I feel like I was like the little, the little spark that got the ember going. And then now it's just spread out and all of, all of these other departments are now doing that within our tribe. We even have a tourism grant that um, was funded. And so it just starts with, you know, an idea or a question. So just wanted to add that because um, sometimes it's scary. It really is. <laughs> and Roxanne, remind us where you're, where you are. At Fort Peck Community College in Poplar. Got it, great. Hi, hey. Roxanne makes a really important point is that, um, and that was part of my story too, is that when I started, like I said, nobody was bringing in grant money to do things related to research or even extension or anything. And um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the only one nowadays, which is great to see. And of course, you know, people like Karen Colbert and all the, the wonderful things she does, but we have an extension program. We have interest from other faculty. So I think, I think Roxanne nailed it. These things can um, definitely build on themselves in a good way. Andrew, I, I would just piggyback off of that. I put a few links in the chat menu, and then I also sent them to Heidi um, that she could share with you. But at the Achieving the Dream conference last week, the um, the person who's over the National Endowment for the Humanities, who is a Navajo um, Diné woman, was there, Shelley Lowe, and she talked about you know, really encouraging the tribal colleges to apply for those NEH grants. And I've reviewed for them before. Um, and there tends to be, you know, a lack of tribal colleges applying. And I know that's an area of, of interest to that particular um, organization. The National Science Foundation is another place that I've reviewed for. And they have, you know, set aside specific for tribal colleges. And that's a concern that they've expressed in the past is the lack of applicants. So I think there, there's a lot of these agencies that are really eager to fund tribal college um, faculty and students. I think there's issues around capacity um, and infrastructure and the, the ability to be able to not only write, but then to manage those grants. And then there's questions about sustainability. But that might be something, you know, Heidi and I've talked about future faculty development workshops and maybe grant writing is something, um, you know, that you would want to consider, Heidi, for the future. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Yeah, those those are really important points, which again, I'll go back to possibly my most important suggestion because this can be daunting. You know, we all we 
anything that uh, any of you are doing, I've probably felt it, experienced it, I've probably been there. Um, it can be daunting. Um, but the idea of just starting small for a lot of the reasons that Susan just touched on to ensure that it's something you can manage and to maybe reduce the competition. I mean, it does take a lot of time and effort to write a good grant proposal. It would be nice to have a reasonable chance to get funded. And that tends to be what uh, what you get with um, with smaller grants. In fact, the first couple ones that I got um, were considered mini grants. And usually when you see something that pitches itself as a mini grant, that tends to mean, you know, write a halfway decent proposal, you're probably going to get the money. So <laughs> starting small to figure out what you're able to handle and from the institutional level, Susan mentioned another good point there, like capacity, you know, even capacity beyond you and what you do. Those are, those are important questions. So I feel like just breaking through that first wall and getting that first little project going, whatever it is, um, can maybe alleviate a lot of that anxiety that that naturally does go along with this. Yeah, let me let me add something to all this from my outside of TCU perspective, but having had my hands in a number of research projects with TCUs uh, and within organization, you're building your projects you know, they're not like dissertations. They don't just sit on a shelf. I think they become assets for you personally, as well as for your institution and for your tribe, because there's tribal knowledge built into these. And so they can be used as resources. They can be brought into your courses as, you know, curriculum enhancements. Uh, you know, and if it's tribal knowledge, you're not going to get it anywhere else. So you're doing it for your institution. And so the, the point is, is that there's a number of very positive things that can happen with your research projects. You end up putting together, I like to call them breadcrumbs in the forest, right? Because you're putting these things here, there that you can always go back to to show the progression. And they can be utilized for your program reviews as well. And I think that's that was already hit on by Andrew, uh, that all of these things, I think, have a huge benefit outside of the fact that you're doing a research project. Not, and the other piece is, the capacity and skill set that you develop along the way and the networks all feed into the other kinds of work that comes down in the future. I have a number of projects. I can't do all the work, but I can hire people that I know who can do the analysis, some heavy hitting statistical analysis, for instance, because I've gotten to know them over the years and I know their skill set. And so when I write a research grant project uh, through a foundation, for instance, I know who I can go to to do the qualitative analysis, for instance, and who can do the interviews. So maybe you become the project director rather than doing all of the work eventually. Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. What other thoughts or questions do you all have? Oh, Andrew, did you have another? Well, I was thinking similar to what David just said, um, for me, it's hiring students. So even, you know, me taking on extra work in some aspects, um, if I have the funding to hire students, maybe they can help relieve some of my workload in other areas. It's great to have students that I can count on to go clean the lab or, you know, uh, take the recyclables back or whatever the case is. Um, so, um, so David's definitely right um, that with the, with the, the resources, comes the ability to, you know, get some help. And, you know, that can often be for a lot of us at tribal colleges, and, you know, that can be students too. Yeah, we have just a couple of minutes. And so I'm just curious, I know that um, walking into this session today, I looked at your sign up and everybody had a, there was a range of experience with research, a range of knowledge. Um, and my guess is that some of you may not um, pursue research or maybe you will start small, but I think even just knowing about research, it can help you to support other people at your institution who are doing research. Maybe you will be inspired to dip your toe in the water and do a very small research project for um, for your with your students. And so I think that and and we're hoping that as you walk away today, even if you never do a research project or apply for a grant, 
that you walk away having um, more comfort level with um, research so that you can, um, again, support it at your institution and that you can maybe be um, more comfortable in using it. And so maybe if you are doing some, you know, uh, curriculum revision or review and you can go into the, the research on um, in your field and incorporate what you've learned into your curriculum. So maybe you're not actually doing research, but you're more comfortable with using it. So we hope that this session um, just provided a lot of ideas and inspiration, gave you a stronger foundation in research. And then for some of you, that maybe it will be the little nudge that you needed to maybe jump into research. And we at the College Fund, we um, we don't formally support research projects, but if you have any questions or wanna be connected with any, any folks that maybe can support you on your own journey as a researcher, please feel free to reach out to me and I can, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to support you in, in your own efforts. So we have just a couple of minutes left and I wanted to leave um, Susan and Andrew with any final words that they wanted to leave us with before we ended today. So Susan, I don't know if you have anything, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I, I just wanna thank you again, Heidi, for um, kind of being the, the brainchild behind this series of, of faculty development workshops and to appreciate Andrew for partnering on this. And just to reiterate the point that, you know, research doesn't have to be scary and it looks, research looks different in all different kinds of contexts. You know, we've talked a lot about grant funding. I've done some research on a shoestring budget, and I think it's important to remember that, that it doesn't have, research money is important, right? Particularly when you're in institutions where their budgets are, are really tight, but you can also do some really great work on small budgets. And I would encourage you all to think about ways in which to inc incorporate research into your um, into your teaching, to think about small projects that might be student assignments that don't necessarily feel like additional burden on you, but that's a great way um, to get started with research. And then just to echo your point, um, Heidi, about being able, even if you're not conducting research, being able to read research studies or read the literature and to be able to be a really savvy consumer of that research and to recognize that all research is not good research. Um, and I think that is that is a critically important skill set to have is to be able to read and to be able to uh, to identify good research or distinguish good research from not so good research. Andrew? I don't think I could top that, so I'll I'll leave it there. Susan nailed it. Thanks. So. I, I would also just like to thank everybody who joined us today. I mean, this is a this is a significant amount of your day that you um, have dedicated or set aside for this session. Um, and I, I just look forward to the opportunity to continue talking with each of you in our upcoming sessions. Andrew and I have both put our email addresses in the chat box. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or want to continue the conversation. Yeah. And have a great day. The sun <laughs> is shining in Colorado and it's a beautiful day here. Thank you. So I just want to thank again, Susan and Andrew for joining us for preparing these presentations, thinking about what um, might be most helpful and relevant for you. Um, we will be posting the recording from this session on our website, as well as on prof to prof .com. Um, that is an online community where we are, uh, the College Fund is hosting sort of its discussion boards and more of a community and interaction among faculty. So if you're not yet a member of prof to prof so it's prof, the number two, and then prof.com, I will send the link out. Please go ahead and um, join and we can continue the discussion. So I will let you know as soon as the recordings and the recording and the slides are up on our site so that you can look at them again and we would love for you to share them with your, with your colleagues. So um, we look forward to seeing you at the next session where we'll be talking about indigenous research methods. You've all been invited to that. It's the same Zoom link for all four of the sessions. So just happy to continue the conversation and reach out to me with any questions. And then Andrew and Susan are also happy to follow up with you too. So thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a great day. All right, bye-bye.